Welcome to the 700 Club Canada. I'm Brian Warren. And I'm Laura Lynn Tyler Thompson. It's great to be with you. We've got a great show today, including two amazing stories. That's right. A little later in the program, we have a story of a woman who was finally set free from years of struggling to overcome abuse. Mm -hmm. If you're struggling with an ongoing emotional issue, this story is for you. But first, an incredible Jerusalem Dateline feature story. Archaeologists have actually uncovered tiles from the second temple in Jerusalem. It's an incredible piece that shows how today's modern technology is actually bringing the ancient past to life. And the Bible as well. Take a look. Mm -hmm. Israeli archaeologists announced they discovered what the floor of the second Jewish temple looked like. It's an amazing story of how the new discoveries are bringing both the past and the Bible to life. This major find came as archaeologists reconstructed 2,000-year-old tiles from the second Jewish temple built by King Herod. These are the very floors upon which the high priests and uh, the priesthood and the pilgrims who came to the Temple Mount walked. And this is the floor upon which Jesus walked when he came to the Temple Mount. This discovery resulted from a controversy in 1999 when tons of debris was illegally removed from under the Temple Mount to build an underground mosque. Now we have uh, the pieces of the flooring tiles for the last 12 years of work from the soil of the Temple Mount. We identified them already some 10 years ago and uh, we understood that they belonged to such floors. The Temple Mount Sifting Project began in 2004. For more than a decade, volunteers and staff from Israel and around the world have been examining the debris from the Temple Mount and making historic discoveries. This is the first time that we are able to restore one of the elements of the architecture of uh, uh, the Second Temple uh, in Jerusalem. Archaeologists confirm the authenticity of these pieces based on the various sizes, materials, and technique by which they were made. I never thought that I would be able to find something that is uh, so much connected to the temple proper. Project director archaeologist Gabby Barkai pointed out why this achievement should be important for Christians. This is the very floor upon which the coins were rolling when Jesus turned uh, the tables of the money changers upside down. This is the very floor upon which those coins were rolling. We have several different stories where Jesus is sitting with his disciples in the porticos and he's teaching them right there. They're standing, they're sitting right here on these floors. Researcher and mathematician Frankie Snyder played a key role in putting the tile patterns together. This is the first Herodian pattern I was actually able to reconstruct. Snyder restored the ornate patterns combining geometric principles with comparisons to designs at Herod's palaces. You find that in the Herodian patterns, the mathematics is impeccable. The sizes, the shapes, how they're putting these things together is just amazing. So far, about 600 colored stone floor tile pieces have been discovered. It's sort of like putting together a puzzle but without a box top, you don't know what the picture's gonna look like, and you only have about 1% of the tiles. We're not out to try to prove anything. The temple was there, but we can show you more clearly exactly, exactly what was there. For years, present day visitors to the Temple Mount imagined Herod's temple was made from white stone. Now Barkai says the restoration of the floor tiles gives a deeper understanding and appreciation for the glory of the second Jewish temple. Laura Lynn, there's a song that says, kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name, the name of Jesus. Yeah. When you start looking uh, at biblical integrity, you know, you can mm. anchor your faith upon that because archeologically, you yeah. can find proof. It's the very tiles that Jesus walked on, mm -hmm. historically, and also anthropologically in that culture when Herod made that second temple. It yeah. said in the prophet, and, and, and this was Hosea the prophet, mm -hmm. he said the latter shall be greater than the former. And uh, I think this is fantastic because mm -hmm. Jesus walked in that temple. That's what made it much greater than yeah. the temple of Solomon. 
you know, can you imagine the commitment yeah. of uh, these people working on Hat this? Haggai, excuse me, I said Hosea, but Haggai. Right, prophet. right. Mm -hmm. The commitment of these people taking all those little rocks that, you know, just, you know, it was illegally all yes. dug up, you know, and, and having the patience to just put those together. How significant, how beautiful. Yes. Oh, it's just, you know... But in our day that this is being uncovered, and you know, that's the amazing. It 600 is. different the colors. Proof. That yes. is, it's the proof. Yes. I mean, so many people are looking for proof. You know, mm -hmm. you need to see this. But the Bible said, mm -hmm. faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now yeah. we're getting evidence and it's yes. only proving what we knew by faith. And they keep digging up new things. I new just things. heard from someone who just got back from Israel yes. that uh, they have found now uh, an, uh, a signet of Isaiah. Yes. Yes. And it's just like, you know, everyone's all jazzed about it because it took a lot of digging to, to find this. And just proof that the Bible is true, that yep. historically it's an accurate account of what happened, all of the prophecies that predicted that there would be a Savior that would come. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it also proves that Jerusalem was the capital city of of the, the Israel people, the, yes. the Israel nation, right? The Israelites. Right. So, I mean, this is just such a, a powerful discovery. Mind boggling. Mind boggling. Oh, it's just wonderful. Up next, a remarkable story of light from one of the darkest eras in world history. 911, what's your emergency? We have a vehicle that is upside down and on fire. These people are trapped and we need the jaws of life. My feet were on fire. The car was filling up with smoke. There was fire coming in through my left door. The steering wheel was stuck in my chest, I couldn't move. The seat belt, I kept trying to release it, but it wouldn't release. And I just screamed, God, send your angels now. I saw a set of just white hands. It was just a burst of white light. It was part of history that no one can forget. During the reign of Nazi dictator Adolf Hitler, Jews lived under daily terror. Their synagogues were burned, and millions were sent to concentration camps. Six million perished. Some nations opened their doors to the fleeing Jews. China was one of them. Many Jewish families applied for visas to come to China. All of a sudden, cities like Shanghai became home of the Jewish refugees. Many were relieved that China was a safe place, a country that changed their lives. Elizabeth Linton was born in Austria. She and her husband recently visited Shanghai, China. Not for sightseeing, but in memory of her deceased father, Michael Weiss, who came to Shanghai after fleeing the Holocaust. Weiss was born in Vienna, Austria, after Hitler overran the country. As they drew, he realized that he couldn't safely remain in the country. Uh, after he came to Shanghai, he um, was working as an engineer. He had graduated from the university in Vienna. He was about 25 years old at the time. When I hear stories about how the nations, many of the nations, including America, uh, turned away Jewish people seeking refuge, it, uh, it really is heartbreaking when you think about it. But look at what the Chinese people did. They opened their arms to a persecuted people. Some came without visas, some came without passports, without proper documentation. Upon landing in China, American missionary couple Thorne and Carol Stearns embraced Wise. And they introduced him to Watchman Nee in the church in Shanghai. Watchman Nee was a church leader and Christian teacher who worked in China at the time. Exposed to many Chinese Christians, Weiss was deeply touched by their help and love for him. He learned about the Bible from the Chinese Christians. I think it was 15th of November 1939, he was baptized by Watchman Nee. Watchman Nee gave him the name Johannes as his Christian name, and Johannes stands for John. Just when Weiss thought things would get better, the Japanese military invaded Shanghai and he was taken prisoner and sent to a concentration camp. During the imprisonment, he was threatened numerous times with death. However, Weiss only did two things, read the Bible and pray. At the end of World War II, Johannes Michael Weiss stayed another eight years in China before moving back to Vienna. 
he immediately started a new life. And he prayed. I have uh, many prayers that he wrote down for his children uh, that we would come to know God early in life and embrace the faith in God with all our hearts. Today, as she walks around the Shanghai Jewish Refugee Museum, she was drawn to all the memories here. It made it real that he, he was here, and especially the name of John that was given to him as his uh, Christian name. Johannes Michael Weiss passed away in 1983. With a degree in theology studying, he never stopped giving praises to Jesus and thankfulness for the Chinese who introduced him to the Lord. And my father told me that the Word of God kept him alive. Meng Fei Li, CBN News. Johannes Michael Wise. You know, what a, what a powerful testimony of, of God's grace and His mercy as well. You know, uh, Elizabeth, when she said, it was the Word of God that allowed my dad to survive. And uh, when you think about that dark chapter in history, where over six million Jews died in concentration camps, and uh, after the Stearns introduced him to Watchman Nee, he found that uh, the Japanese came and he was in prison. But the Bible says something that's so powerful, and I, I got this, and I, I pray that this hit you because I've got chills all over my spirit. It says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. They didn't shrink from death. You know, uh, Johannes Michael Wise, he was able to witness by his life, but it was the Chinese people in Watchman Nee that gave him that understanding of the love of God, that gave him that, uh, that courage, that fortitude to, to even stick with it and write that in his diary for his daughter to find. And uh, that's what witnessing is all about. When you begin to share what God has done in your life, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. No matter what goes on on the outside, you become stronger. Because when we're weak, we are strong. And this is what we need in this generation, in this, first, this 21st century Canadian society. And it's yours for the asking, one 855 700 But I want to pray for you that God would give you that testimony, but a legacy no matter what you're going through. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for Johannes Michael Wise. And we ask you that you would, even now, those that are watching, Lord, we repent not for the past, but for the future, because we'll have another opportunity. But let us stand and let us have that, that rock-solid faith, Lord, when our time comes, that we must be a witness of your goodness. May you bless those that are listening now, and they, may they leave a lasting legacy in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. Up next, Tina finally walks in freedom after years of suffering and torment from abuse. You don't want to miss it. It was always after something horrible happened. I would say, I need to go play into the woods, and she would know, or vice versa. Tina Beauchamp and her twin sister played their game of make-believe often, one pretending to be lost, the other coming to her rescue. More than a game, it was an escape from a sexually and physically abusive sibling. It was very confusing, because as a little kid, you have really no idea what's going on. As you get a little older, this, this, this isn't right. Something's, something's wrong here. And you start to think that you are just trash and that you're not worth anything. 
Tina grew up in a poor neighborhood in California with a single mother of five. She hardly knew her father. Their mother neglected them, and the only attention she gave came through harsh discipline. I just remember just being sad all the time. It's like, where is that love? You get up every day and you're a shell of a person. There's nothing to look forward to. The one time Tina worked up the nerve to say something about the abuse, her mother did nothing about it. It is the ultimate betrayal, and it is almost as though that's it. If your own mother won't defend you or try and do something about it, it confirms in your mind that you are worthless. The sexual abuse stopped when Tina stood up to her abuser at age 10, but the chaos and physical abuse at home continued. At 13, she downed a bottle of aspirin trying to escape the pain. When that failed, she turned to promiscuity, drugs, and alcohol. It was like, oh my gosh, this thing is, I'm numb when, when I'm doing this. I was much more free. I was able to laugh. Um, things became funny. At 16, with no ambitions or hope for her future, she dropped out of school. And at 18, she married a physically and verbally abusive man. The day we got married, something sort of broke in me. And I, I remember just breaking down and crying. And the people that were there thought, oh, she's so happy, she's crying. That's not why I was crying. I was crying because I felt like I had sealed my fate. Like, well, this is the best I can do. This is what I'm good for, is to be abused. They moved to the East Coast to be closer to her husband's family. After earning her GED and landing a job in banking, Tina poured herself into her work. I would go to work and I would do an excellent job because I wanted that praise. My boss has always loved me, so that became my new drug, my new escapism. Afraid her husband would hurt her if she tried to leave, she endured the marriage. After nine years, two of her sisters gave her the courage and a plane ticket to leave and fly back to California. But soon she was back to finding escape through drugs and unhealthy relationships. At this point, I'm still trying to fill myself with something. And all this other stuff over here to the left is not working. It works temporarily, but it wears off. In her 30s, Tina decided to volunteer at a local church's ministry, thinking that helping others might fill the void. She even began attending Sunday services on occasion. Then one morning, she woke up, feeling a darkness she'd never felt before. There was something that came on me. It felt like an oppression. And I had been depressed before, so I knew what that felt like. This was very different. I woke up with it. I was at work with it. And it was, it, it really is hard to describe because it is such a dark place. The feeling got worse, and she decided to go to a woman's Bible study. The study was on the book of James. Because this darkness, this oppression was so severe, I said, I've got to try it. I have to try something. I'm desperate. This darkness is on me, even though I'm opening the Bible up. They asked me to read, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, okay. So as, as soon as I start reading James, that oppression went away. And that darkness never came back. Wanting to know more, she started digging into the Bible for answers. One night, she arrived early to Bible study and noticed a scripture reference on the board. Oh, Jeremiah 29, 11. Okay, so I looked it up, and it was like, that was written for me. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. And I thought, oh my gosh, you really are pursuing me. Finally, she understood that her only hope would come through salvation in Jesus Christ. Soon after, she made a decision. All that stuff that happened to me in the past, he's renewed me as his daughter. And what Jesus did on the cross, him going step by step, carrying that cross for us, it hit me in that moment and I fell down on my knees. Jesus, no matter what happens in this life, 
and no matter what has happened in this life, you're it, you're it for me. You're that thing that I've been searching for for so long. After giving her life to Christ, she realized she still needed to heal from her past. She sought counseling from a Christian therapist and asked God for help. I remember my first counseling appointment and I said, Jesus, please come with me. Well, he was already there, but uh, hold my hand. I need for you to hold my hand going in here. As she grew in her faith, Tina overcame the hurt from her past. She now works with victims of human trafficking and has plans to open a women's shelter. She says that Jesus took away all of her pain and gave her purpose instead. He's using what I went through to help women now that don't know him, uh, that don't feel that they have value or worth. And I'm there to say that you do. You absolutely do. Mm, that's a beautiful story. You know, I can personally testify to the goodness and the power in the Word of God, uh, just like Tina did as she began to read James and as she began to let the Word wash over her, she felt healed. And this is, uh, this is what Romans 8, 25 says. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And it talks again about our weakness over in 2 Corinthians 12, verse uh, nine, but, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. You know, when we go through painful trauma in our life and something happens, people abuse us. Some of us have experienced terrible, terrible things. There is a truth in the word that we don't have to feel uh, strong in and of ourselves, but that when we are weak, God can make us strong. Tina became strong and powerful in her life and is now helping others that are facing and have been through some of the same situations that she went through. Why? Because Christ's strength became her strength. And that's all we have to rely on. You might be sitting there today and you're feeling, you know, very weak and overtaken with all of the pain. Emotional wounds can be very deep very painful, but the Word of God, it is like a healing salve to your life. I, I challenge you today to just get out the book, go to James like she did and begin reading it and let that Word go deep into your heart and it will heal you. You know, it's time for a new day. Doesn't that sound good? A new day. Let all that old stuff, you know, be put away from you and and walk into a new season in your life. We have a resource for you. 1-855-759-0700. Absolutely free. Just give us a call. Well, we believe in prayer and we'll pray for your needs right after the break. So stay with us. Too often we carry baggage from our past. You know what it's like. It affects everything and everyone in our lives. It's always there, weighing us down and keeping us from achieving true happiness. But do you know God never meant for us to be trapped in the past? You can be free of your baggage. Learn how God's forgiveness leads to changed lives and new beginnings. Call the 700 Club. Welcome back. In our latest premium, Angels, discover how these angelic messengers are an important and fascinating part of God's creation. They sure are. You know, this DVD also includes real stories of people's encounters with angelic forces as well as biblical insight that will help you understand how angels play an important role in life. Now, if this topic interests you, call us today. We'll get it, get it to you right away. And uh, as you become a part of the 700 Club Canada family, it would be such an encouragement to us. The number is 1-855-759-0700. Prayer partners are standing by. Mm -hmm. and we want to thank you for all of your praise reports, but also liking us on social media. It's great to hear back and forth from you. We really are encouraged every time. But would you put on your prayer list Barbara from Barry? She's asking for salvation for Jesse. And also Sherry from Coleman, Alberta. Prayer for her strength. 
Father, we just thank you, God, for who you are, for your grace, for your goodness in our lives. We thank you, Lord, uh, that you know exactly what Sherry is dealing with. We ask that you would interject yourself, oh God. She is asking for your, uh, your guidance and your support, Jesus. So we come into agreement with her prayer, and we ask that your presence would be with her, that your wisdom would be there, that, God, you would open doors that are, are right for her and that you would give her discernment about that which is not the right path for her to take. We ask all of this in your name. In Jesus' name. And Father, with uh, Barbara, we come into agreement for the spirit of adoption for Jesse. Lord, you know the way that Jesse travels. And we pray even in this moment that his eyes of understanding would open and that he would have a divine encounter with you that would change his life and cause him to be engrafted in the family of God. We thank you for his life. We thank, ooh, God, it is so. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Wow. You know, when we were uh, talking about the Holocaust, you know, I, I go back to that moment and uh, I thank God for Michael Wise and Elizabeth because of their testimony. Yes. Because I see that as a part of uh, a real challenging chapter, but there were bright spots because people held on to their faith. Right. And I believe that's what God is calling us to do. It is, it is. And you know, uh, we can hang on to that because we have a rock, we have a foundation. Foundation. And, yeah. you know, Job came to that place after all of his suffering in yes. his life. Uh, we personally have not experienced these atrocities, but we can say in our lives that, you know, Lord, we trust you so in incredibly that though you slay us, yet will we trust you. Amen. We have that kind of committed faith yes. to the Word of God. And in, in this current environment where everyone is so concerned about uh, prosperity and other mm. things, the real gift is salvation and knowing that we have an eternal security. Yes, it is. That's what Jesus came to give us. Mm. You know, we want to leave you with a power verse and hold on to this as your love letter. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future, Jeremiah 29 and 11. Mm. Until next time. God bless. To contact us, phone 1-855-759-0700. You can email us at cba at 700club.ca or write to us at Christian Broadcasting Associates, Incorporated. The 700 Club Canada, P.O. Box 700, Scarborough, Ontario, M1S 4T4. You can now like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter or Instagram.